Hey, this is Bo Hawkins, and uh, we're in the uh, character setup uh, department. They set up the characters and props and anything that has to be articulated and moving. These guys, uh, uh, they provide all the controls that the animators will use to actually bring the characters to life. So if the characters aren't set up properly, they're not going to animate properly. So they have to be, uh, their work involves a lot of math, a lot of expressions, a lot of attention to detail, knowledge of animation and posing, uh, so they know where the characters are going to need to go, uh, so they can rig them properly. So, uh, uh, and what they do is they try to make it as transparent as possible to the animators, because uh, as you'll see, there's lots and lots of controls involved, and it can be a little daunting. So they, they do that and then also package it to where it'll uh, be presentable to the animator so uh, he can get to the controls he needs quickly. Once we have everything actually ready to go and, and ready to move around, then we're, we're set to actually hand the, the, the system that we've created off to the animators to allow them to actually start bringing the characters into scenes and having them start acting. Normally with, with characters like this, we call these the primary characters. And since this, we have a lot of kids in this movie, we'll send it from this point, once John and Keith are happy with the, the work, we'll send it to uh, a group that we call crowd control. And they'll put in background characters, uh, background elements, and things like that. And, and then just finish it from there, send it to the second layout. That's usually the next step after that. Drip locked down, then we start the, the storyboarding process. So uh, designs and uh, uh, boards can sort of happen somewhat simultaneously, um, just out of necessity. In a perfect world, everything would be designed first, uh, but usually everything is happening uh, a little bit overlapping. So uh, around you, you see a lot of the, uh, the concepts and designs that were being worked on uh, while the, the boards were originally done. Uh, some of the things that weren't designed yet, the board artists went ahead and threw designs in there. That's what storyboarding is. It's just visual notes. It's trying to take you know, that script, which is just words, and make the first attempt at, gee, what's that going to look like? As, a, as an image. I am something that is increasingly rare in digital film. I'm the film guy. I'm the person who's responsible for getting it from here in the computer onto this stuff called motion picture film, which unfortunately is becoming more and more rare even as we speak. But until that time comes, we still have to go from this to this, which is sort of like mixing apples and fish because the way computers look at color and process color information is about as far away from how film does it as anything could be. Lots of variables, you know, how bright it is, is it the right color, is it the right contrast ratio, are there illegal colors like you get in video, because you can actually have illegal colors in film as well. And those are all the things that I have to keep on top of. And I'll probably be with the show right through answer printing and video transfer. The art direction on this is very different. It looks more like live action. It isn't photo real but we're using lighting as it would in a real environment. Uh, they're using a lot of filtered color since it's a cartoon. Uh, so when it's subtle, but you miss it if it's not there, like when they're going through the cave and the rocks are green, there's like a little green fill light on their faces. And when they're flying around above the earth, there's like blue fill light from the atmosphere. Things that you only, you, like I said, you only notice them if they're not there. But it gives the show a very colorful, happy, cartoony kind of look without being silly and stupid. Ideally, you would think that we could render it at exactly the color that we want, but even with all the alchemy and all of my experience, they're always just a little bit different. I mean, just today I had to, uh, to re-time uh, a couple of reels, and it's like, you know, a kiss of yellow here and a touch of green there and maybe a little blue somewhere else, just a point or two. But it makes all the difference in the world. The storyboard artists have been uh, frantically work drawing hundreds and thousands of little pictures that they get scanned into the computer and brought into the Avid, where... Uh, John and, and Susan edit them together uh, against the soundtrack, and they look something like this. Oh, uh, that Nick is not such a bad guy. Are you kidding? He's a genius. He's a genius. He's, uh, oh, uh, no offense, oh, Jimmy. Yeah. None taken. Initially, the first phase that we'll go through is John will come in, we'll have all the performances done from the actors, and we'll sit down, and that kind of that bass dictates our timings for picture and uh, and everything else that, that transpires after that. We'll go through and just audition all the takes and a lot of times we'll cut, you know, well I like the first part of that take but the last part of this take so we cannibalize a lot of the audio and cut it together here right. and uh, so John will work through that and we'll be sitting in here together uh, building it and that's a lot of fun because we you know, when I uh, am working with the actors, I encourage them to go off script. You know, we'll cover everything and then just, you know, have fun with it. And a lot of good stuff comes, you know, out when they're doing that. So we'll take little bits and pieces that will fit in without, 
you know, interrupting the flow of the conversation. The main thing for an editor is that I, it's when you are in a, a live shoot or a, you know, when you're getting footage, it comes in and you do it once because you're given what they shot. Well, it's not that way here. I start out with storyboards, well, even the audio part. Then we go to the storyboards. Then we move on to a layout phase and an animation phase and then layout two and then lighting. This is actually... Uh, these are some drawings by Dave Lux, and he'll go from this, this will be our template, and then he'll go on to the layout phase, and this is what we'll get back from layout, which is basically characters are placed in the environment, and we'll get general timings, and then after that, it's handed off to animation, and John will direct uh, the performance of, of what he wants the, the characters to do, and we'll start getting this back. Actually, I find his insights on how to deal with one's parents quite refreshing. It's uh, lighting retakes, and uh, this is um, where we come to check out on the Barco here all of the shots that are submitted for final lighting. idea back in the 80s about a little boy who runs away from home and runs away in a rocket rather than run, running away you know, on foot, and it was going to be a live-action film uh, back then and then when we started working uh, more in CGI it became apparent that we could do this traditionally when we're designing the characters we'll design them on paper with pencils and uh, then Paul who I worked with throughout the whole process he would take those drawings that we would do and he would make he would actually sculpt maquettes out of some of the main characters and the modelers could use those and they would have a 3D version they could see well instead of trying to imagine what you know Cindy or Libby or Miss Fowl looked like from the back here it is I'll just I'll just make it look like that and it, it was a great help in getting everybody ramped up and used to working in the neutron style we like characters we like, you know, funny, goofy, endearing little characters that, uh, you know, in this case, it, you can take the whole family to. And there's not a lot of, you know, really appropriate movies to take your family to. Paul Allen, and I am uh, the 3D animation supervisor for the Jimmy Neutron movie. This is a good example of blocking right here, is uh, we do everything on... Uh, on flat keys just so we can see the posing and it looks uh, it looks like it's stuttering a little bit that's just because it's going from pose to pose to pose and once uh, Keith and John see this part of the process they're happy with uh, the composition of the shot what the character's doing the uh, acting performance we take that shot and we unflatten it and then we can quickly get in front of them see if they like it see how it's cutting together in context for the movie and then we unflatten it and finish out the secondary animation, put in the background characters, and there you go. Yes, this is, uh, this is Jimmy's face, the, the geometry of Jimmy's face unwrapped. And what we do is, uh, is uh, paint onto this little template of his geometry unwrapped, take that image, and then wrap it back around his head to give him, uh, give him colors in his cheek and stuff like that. His hair was a big challenge trying to get the the level of detail and stuff that we wanted and uh, actually when you see when you see his hair in his regular position it's it's uh, sticking straight up in the air and uh, what we did is you know it, it helps the texture department to straighten things out like that and we get this this image of, of his hair unwrapped and then uh, go through different levels of, of painting, adding detail. We use the black and white hair map as a bump map and a, uh, a diffuse map to give some of the darkening in the, in the ridges and valleys in his hair. And uh, the, the white parts of the image tell the computer where to bump out, and the blacker parts tell it where to, where to pull the image in. So it looks like he has 
has dimension in his hair, and you can see when the light hits it, it looks like it has real shape. And you see with the with the uh, the face map here, it doesn't look like much when I have it in Photoshop, but when we apply it to the the object itself, that's what's giving him the color in his face, the his ruddy cheeks and and his red lips. Here's a, a look at some of the images that that make up the textures of Goddard. This is the the tiles on the side of his of his body, the bump map that makes it look dimensional and bump out from the surface. Here's a little metal plate that's actually on his nose. This is what makes up his ears. Here's some little shading that goes around its mouth. He's the uh, head of the modeling department, and after the characters are designed, uh, then they go into modeling so they can actually be built. It's like building little miniatures, except you're doing it all on the computer. So everything, again, starts off with a hand drawing, and then from a drawing, uh, we typically, for main characters, go to a maquette stage where we can start visualizing it in 3D before we start on the computer. So we can kind of hold it in our hands and turn them and look at them. Uh, then uh, once we have enough information, modelers dive in and start pushing the little points and polygons around and uh, actually it's a kind of a CG sculpting process. And I'll turn it over to, to Sean here. Uh, so by virtue of his immense brain, he can go and, and uh, uh, do things like uh, fly and, and um, build a rocket ship, run away from home, walk on the ceiling, be invisible, uh, shrink himself down to an, the size of an ant or enlarge himself up to you know, the size of a planet. Um, he gets to live out all the kid fantasies that uh, you know, most people have when they're a kid. I was starting out to do it as a live action short film. Just I tried to get a grant to do it and was going to do it live action with effects and uh, I couldn't get a grant to do it so I just kind of put it on the back burner for a while and then when DNA started getting more into 3D technology uh, I looked at it one day and said, you know, this would be a really cool property to do the look I was going for is, is to keep it a, a cartoon, strictly, and don't let, with, with 3D, uh, doing cartoony imagery is, in a way, more challenging than doing photoreal, because doing photoreal implies realistic human proportions. It's very easy to handle the ergonomic concerns uh, of the show, because with CG work, uh, with 3D, uh, ergonomics is really important, because everything has to be built to fit the function of the characters' bodies. Well, if you've got characters with huge heads, little bodies, uh, big feet, uh, doing things like like walking through doors becomes a problem. Mom cannot walk through a door. Her hair is so big that she cannot. So every time she does, it's a big cheat. We we compi it requires compositing just to get her through a door. <laughs>